The Riches on the Page Picture Books for Fluent Readers, Grades 2 and Up by Sarah Scoggin of the Newburgh Free Library, April 2021 Why read picture books if you are already a fluent reader? The writer Catherine Rundle explores how children's books ignite and can reignite the imagination how children's fiction, with its unabashed emotion and playfulness, can awaken old hungers and create new perspectives on the world. And also, if you are an older reader, uh, you can read what you missed. There might have been uh, classic books that, for whatever reason, you didn't encounter or you didn't pick up when you were younger, and you could take a look at that and say, would young me have loved this book? Why or why not? But no matter what your age, there are picture books that can speak to you. As a children's librarian, I encounter time and time again uh, instances where children, they love picture books, they love reading them, and then the moment that they are able to read on their own, they leave the picture book section and they never look back. They might think, those are not the books for me. Or some parents try to hurry their children through picture books in order to get them to quote unquote real books that don't have pictures. But the truth is that visual literacy and appreciating visual images that go with a story is behind so many different kinds of works of art, of books, that are meant for adults too. Every graphic novel, comic, every illustrated book that is meant to speak to us is in its own way a picture book. And there are many picture books that are designed for older readers. Uh, they're not really meant for the preschool crowds. So some of them definitely are for the two-year-olds, the three-year-olds, the pre-readers. But there are many that are really aimed at older readers and they sadly just never get read because their intended audience never goes into the picture book area to look for them. It might be something like Animalium, a museum in a book by Kay Scott and Jenny Broom. And it's just a gorgeous, as it says, museum in a book. There's so much to look through, so many images. No matter what your age, you could just be fascinated by the images of all these living things. It might be a picture book like Journey by Aaron Becker, uh, which is a wordless book. So if you were to read this story to yourself or to another person, you would have to provide the narration. Would you describe what you see? Would you make up dialogue between the different people that you see on the page? Uh, you could even make up your own uh, names for the people. You can make up your own soundtrack if you even wanted to. But you are part of creating the story because the words are not there. You are inferring everything from the story and creating it from the images. So wordless books are terrific for all ages, especially to share. Every person who reads it is going to read it differently. Some books are kind of quirky and don't have one age that they're perfect for because different ages can get different things out of it. Um, so child and an adult are reading a book like Meet the Dullards by Sarah Pennypacker. I think they'll be especially true. So the Dullard family, the parents want their children to do things like watch an unplugged TV. Or better yet, watch paint dry. They want their children to be perfect bores with nothing too exciting. But the children have other ideas. The whole wonder of the world and doing things is just too much for their dullness. The same author, Sari Pennypacker and Yoko Tanaka, also wrote a book called Sparrow Girl, which is kind of on the other end of the spectrum in that it's a picture book, but it's tackling a truly serious topic. This is actually an incident that happened historically. Uh, in China, there was a disastrous attempt um, in the modern communist era to 
destroy sparrows because sparrows were uh, seen as interfering with the crops. But when most of the sparrow population had been destroyed, there weren't enough sparrows to eat the insects. The insect population grew out of control and destroyed much of the food source for China. And there were notes in the back explaining just how devastating this famine was, one of the worst, worst famines um, in history. And it was all created by a misguided attempt uh, to control the ecology. So this is a book that you wouldn't read to a toddler. It's someone that you could read to an older student and have discussions about the way that we treat the world. Uh, many books that are picture books for fluent readers are from history, such as Bob and Girl by Emily Arnold McCulley. And this is based on a true story of a Lowell, Massachusetts Bob and Girl worked in the bobbin factories and that was her job was to uh, empty the full bobbins and put on new ones. Um, but there were many accidents and incidents of uh, disease from breathing in too much lint in the mills and nobody was caring. There would be accidents, people would be seriously injured and they wouldn't even stop the mill machines. So this is an attempt, can they go on strike? Will they be able to get fair wages and better conditions? Another figure from history, much more lighthearted, is Fanny in the Kitchen, uh, the book by Deborah Hopkinson. And this is the uh, lightly fictionalized story of the actual woman, Fanny Farmer, who is considered the authoress of the modern recipe. So she was born in the mid-1800s in Boston, Massachusetts, and she was teaching the child of a wealthy family that she was cooking for how to cook and she realized that cooking would be a lot better if you had exact measurements and exact procedures instead of the old recipes that would say a little of this a handful of that until done um, and so this is really funny attempts by the young girl to learn how to cook and in the end they actually have a recipe to how to make old-fashioned griddle cakes so this would be a terrific book to read while uh, cooking griddle cakes and eating them and talking about food and recipes You can see there, she's uh, putting pie in the oven and there's sort of the old time illustrations of what it would have been like in the kitchen. The Sisters of Skituit Light by Stephen Kransky was the first picture book for fluent readers I discovered when I came to work at Newburgh Free Library. And it is an instance of what I like to call the corners of history. These little incidents of history often very important, but they're small things that don't appear in big textbooks or are often not often told. So this is a picture book based on the true story of two sisters who were living at the Skituit Lighthouse um, during the Revolutionary War. And they were left alone there when a British fleet started coming into the harbor. And so uh, the two of them by themselves were able to use a clever trick to turn back the entire British uh, fleet of boats that was coming into their harbor. Um, fascinating little piece of history that works really well in a picture book because you can have the whole story in just a little short piece and I think this gets children and adults excited about history because this is history right down to the individual level. It's not a giant sweeping description of the whole Revolutionary War. History happening to real people. You can see them there quote-unquote weapons in this fight were a drum and a fife. Uh, the next two books are by Patricia Polacco, the first being Tucky Joe and Little Heart. Um, this is a book that takes place during World War II and Kentucky Joe, um, the main character from America, meets a young girl whom he names Little Heart. And this book, while it does not shy away from the uh, horrors of war, it does have a happy ending. So this would be another instance of making a war or any part of history really real by seeing how it plays out in the lives of real people. This is based on a true story. Uh, the second book, again by Patricia Polacco, is Pink and Say. This is uh, the Civil War, and there are two characters, Pink and Say, you can see there. And this is a story which unfortunately does not have a happy ending for one of the characters. 
Um, again, you wouldn't read this book to a little toddler, but someone who's studying the Civil War, this can make it a whole lot more meaningful to them because they can see what really happened to people in the Civil War. Of course, not all the picture books for older readers are about serious things like wars. We just have some interesting historical stories like Brothers by the author Yin. This is a story of a boy named Ming who moves from China to San Francisco and he's curious about uh, what's like outside of Chinatown. And he befriends a boy named Patrick. Everyone around them is treating Chinatown and outside of Chinatown like two separate worlds, but to these two boys, they're just friends, in fact, brothers. Many of the picture books for fluent readers are things like myths, legends, and poems, things like that. Uh, the Hero Beowulf by Eric A. Kimmel is a perfect example. It's a picture book short retelling of the epic poem Beowulf, uh, which is from before the year AD 1000, um, but it's made accessible in a picture book form. And if you have a reluctant reader who maybe isn't all that into books, but likes an exciting adventure, lots of action, um, story of uh, Beowulf to fighting the evil Grendel might be just the thing to get them interested in reading. And also maybe someday they would read the full poem. Another example of a folktale is Rip Van Winkle by Washington Irving, and this version is retold and illustrated by John Howe. So uh, there are tons of beautiful illustrations to go along with the text, so even though there is a lot of text, it's much more accessible to someone if they can see the pictures alongside. The Storytelling Princess by Raffi Martin is a great example of a book about stories. Here we have a prince that says he will only marry the one who can tell him a story whose ending he does not know, and he's confident he knows all the stories that anyone is going to bring to him, and a princess who is being told that she must marry the prince that her parents have chosen for her, even though she has ideas about going on adventures. So you can see these books, um, they tend to have more text per page than your average picture book for toddlers. Uh, another great book uh, for older readers is Little O by Laura Krauss Melman. And this is the story of a origami daughter who comes to life and has tons of adventures um, outside the home of the mother who folded the magical origami. Um, so you could read this book on its own or you could read this book and then compare to something like Tom Thumb. How are the adventures different? Two stories from different cultures. Uh, what will happen at the end is always the question. Seven Golden Rings by Rajani LaRocca is a tale of music and math. And it tells a story of a young man named Bahagat who is a, a musician at heart and he really wants to go and audition to be one of the Raja's royal musicians. Uh, but how will he pay for his journey? His mother gives him seven golden rings and one rupee, the last that they have. He goes to pay for his night's stay, but the innkeepers insist that he give them the exact price of each night's stay up front. He doesn't want to give them all seven because if he doesn't stay the whole seven days, he will have wasted his gold. And he only has one rupee and the goldsmith is charging one rupee to break a link. So is there a way to break just one link in the chain that will allow him to pay the exact amount each night? It's a great mathematical puzzle um, and I will give you one hint. It is related to binary, the system that is still used to run computers today. Some picture books for older readers are kind of quirky, but they also give great invitations to meaningful conversations. 
and Trup a Fuzz Head Tail by a Nell Cannon is a perfect example. Trup is a fuzz head, which means he's a kind of being sort of like a cat person, but a little bit different. And occasionally, fuzz heads will dress up in human clothes and go into human society just to see what it's like. And nobody really sees him or pays attention to him. Some people yell at him. Um, he gets an injury. And it's not really until he meets a woman named Bernice that somebody really sees him. And Bernice is uh, suffering from homelessness. And so she can understand what it's like to have people walk by her and not see her. Um, and they also have their friend, uh, the Talking Crow, to accompany them. A uh, really interesting story and really makes you think about what we see when we see others. The Child's Story by Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens being the famous name in writing, but this is a lesser known story of his. And it's about a traveler who uh, meets a child and then an older boy, and here you see he's meeting a young man and he's going on a journey. And it really turns out to be the journey of life. Um, I was personally very touched by this story, just how he ha moves through the different ages and stages of his life, the, the joys and the sorrows, and at the end of his life, has he really lost everything that he had on his journey, or is it really still there at the end? So again, a book that you might use with a, a thoughtful child when they get just maybe uh, seven, eight years old, or all the way up through adult, um, appreciating that life really is a journey. Some books for older readers are just a whole lot of fun, like Big Jimmy's Come Cow Chinese Takeout by Ted Lewin. And even the end papers, the inside the front and back covers, is an actual picture of a real Chinese food menu. So you could imagine you're picking off of the menu and we see behind the scenes just what goes into a hectic day of creating Chinese food for all the people in their neighborhood. I actually never really thought about how much really goes into something as simple as Chinese takeout and um, all the interactions and connections with the people, the family, workers, and those who are eating the food. So a fun one I recommend. You might have a fluent reader who really is into sports, uh, who might like By My Brother's Side by Tiki and Rondé Barber, um, based on the actual uh, football players when they were young, um, telling the story of how they really had each other's backs. Some books might be a window to someone whose life just looks different than yours. I Know Here by Laurel Crozier is just such a book. This story is one of a girl who lives in what might be called a town of trailers in the remote area of Saskatchewan, Canada. And the reason that these people are living here is because the fathers of the family are all working together to build a dam. So they're building infrastructure in these remote areas and their families all come with them and one of the trailers has the teacher for all the children who are there um, and I just never thought about that what would that be like to live that kind of life always moving to remote places and this is your home and your town picks up and moves where you do it's just a very interesting perspective that a child who's used to living in a city or a suburban neighborhood might never have thought of I certainly didn't as a child Sometimes a book might even be helpful if you are reading about something in school. Let's say you were doing uh, a unit on World War II um, and you wanted to find, again, a story that will have true human connection. The Whispering Town by Jennifer Elgren is a good example. Uh, and this is the story of a town that was harboring Jews from the Nazis and they wanted to let this family escape but if they tried to light the way to the harbor or show them the way it was a very dark night 
uh, they were afraid they would be caught. But how would they know how to get to the correct part of the harbor where the boat was going to take them to Sweden if they couldn't see? So they had people standing in their doorway whispering this way or making a, a, a whispering sound so they would follow the sound through the dark town and escape. Um, it's just uh, such a moving story of a town that just found a way to save people's lives. Brass Button by Crescent Dragon Wagon is one of those fluent reader picture books that I think might go a little bit deeper than you might think at first glance. This is the story of a button that gets accidentally dropped and through a series of events gets accidentally passed around the neighborhood unbeknownst to the other people uh, and the person who originally lost it. And while it seems like a very simple tale, this would be a great place to start a conversation about how do little tiny things, little accidents, little events, little happening to mention something to somebody else, uh, how does that affect the people? Would what happens at the end of the story have happened, the main event, if the button hadn't been lost or if it hadn't gone through all those different people's hands? Maybe one little decision by one person to keep the button or throw it away or something like that, what would have happened to the rest of the people? Just an interesting uh, thought experiment. Sometimes picture books can be helpful antidotes to a heart that is grieving like The Heart and the Bottle by Oliver Jeffers, where uh, the, our young protagonist has clearly suffered some kind of loss, but when she puts her heart in a bottle, the bottle seems to get heavier and heavier, and everything around her seems to get less important. How can she let her heart out of the bottle? Maybe for something fun, you could do uh, a book movie comparison by reading the book Jumanji. The original is a picture book, so it would be easy to read it in uh, not too long a time, and then watch the movie version, any version, and then talk about the differences, the similarities, uh, what inspired the things in the movie that were in the original book. Would they have made the movie differently after having read the original? Uh, it was just a fun book movie pairing, and there are a lot of these. Speaking of movies, you could always just read these picture book versions of the movies Back to the Future and E.T. Or maybe you want a picture book with characters from a longer book, such as this picture book A Red Wall Winter's Tale by Brian Jakes, using the characters from the chapter book Red Wall series. And then, of course, the parodies. So we have Goodnight Lab, a scientific parody by Chris Ferry. Um, so they say goodbye to their, or goodnight rather, to their spectrometers, and there's uh, Einstein on the wall and things like that. So that's just a fun uh, parody for those who are familiar. And then Goodnight iPad is actually written for adults um, as a joke about having to unplug and put down our devices sometimes more than we do. Um, on the right, we have Your Only Old Once by Dr. Seuss, which uh, he wrote on his 82nd birthday. And it's about the story of a man who has to go through a lot of headache and craziness with the medical system and medical billing and things like that. So um, adults might be able to appreciate uh, his pain. Maybe you want to start a family tradition in all ages read aloud, um, say for the beginning of fall or maybe on Halloween or any holiday or an occasion. For example, Waltz of the Scarecrow by Constance W. McGeorge and Mary White, um, which is a story of some ladies and gentlemen who are having a very elegant uh, soiree, sort of uh, on the lawn, they're having a nice dinner party when a giant flock of crows attacks the crops for next year. So in order to save their food for the upcoming year, all the elegantly dressed party goers have to jump into the field and act like scarecrows. Um, so it's just a really interesting story 
um, and it might make a fun tradition to read it year after year or a fun tradition to read any book um, as your uh, yearly tradition. So no matter what your age, next time you're looking for a book, take a look in the picture book section. You just never know what might fly off the shelf to you.